Fasting is not an equation, it's, it's not a magic formula, it's not a transaction. There is a spiritual, unquantifiable dynamic at play when we choose to fast, when we choose physical hunger to increase our spiritual hunger, when we, when we choose to make a physical choice, trusting that there will be a spiritual release that we may not even be able to see. Fasting is a physical action that we trust causes a spiritual reaction. Today, I want to talk about the divine tool of fasting. Uh, maybe it's just me, but as soon as anyone starts talking about fasting, I feel immediately hungry. <laughs> maybe you feel the same. Uh, I don't know if you've picked up in the news or on social media, but fasting is trending. The new fad diet is intermittent fasting. And I find it funny how often culture takes something that Jesus modeled 2000 years ago and repackages it and then strips it of its spiritual power and then makes the focus of it on us instead of God. So, so prayer becomes mindfulness uh, and fasting becomes the new way to lose weight. And I wonder if, it's not just people outside of the church that have forgotten the true power of fasting. You know, statistically, only 2% of Christians choose to fast regularly. Now, I have been following Jesus for over 20 years, and it's actually only in the last seven years that I have begun to fast regularly myself. And for me, there were three key reasons when I think about it, why I didn't fast regularly before then. Number one, ignorance. I didn't really understand it. I, I don't ever remember being taught how to do it. Uh, it, was, it was rarely modeled to me. Number two, there were issues around certain circumstances in my life. There was a period in my life where I was pregnant a lot and breastfeeding a lot, and it's not always healthy or safe to fast at that time. But there were other circumstances. There was a period of my life where I was struggling with a negative relationship with, towards food, which also added a different dynamic for me around fasting. But number three was apathy. Honestly, one of the main reasons I chose not to fast regularly is because it just felt like too much hard work. And I, I didn't really get anything out of it for myself. And let's face it, like on the surface, fasting is weird. Like fasting is totally counterintuitive. Fasting is denying our body of the food that it is craving for a defined period of time. Uh, it's denying ourselves of the nourishment and the sustenance and the satisfaction that we get out of eating food, that this food that our body craves. And so why would we do that? Maybe you're watching and you're exploring faith for the first time. You're, you're on a journey maybe towards faith. You have questions and, and maybe for you, you didn't even know that fasting was a thing. This is news for you. Maybe you're watching and you have been a Christian for a while and it's never occurred to you to fast regularly. Or maybe a bit like me, You've, you've considered fasting, uh, but there have been some key reasons as to why it hasn't become a regular rhythm. My prayer, my prayer for you, uh, those that are watching, my prayer is that in listening to this, you would be inspired, not condemned, not judged, but inspired, inspired to, to think about fasting as a rhythm of prayer, uh, to think about fasting as a way of connecting with God, uh, to think about fasting as a, as a spiritual gift, a divine tool that God has given each one of us uh, that we can use as we follow him faithfully here on earth. Here's the thing about fasting. There is a massive biblical precedent for fasting. We see fasting running all the way through the scriptures, right at the beginning, right up until the end. Moses fasted, David fasted, Elijah fasted, Esther, Daniel, Hannah, they all fasted, Ezra, Nehemiah, Anna, John the Baptist, the disciples, Paul, they all fasted. Jesus fasted. And so the simple question 
to the simple answer to the question, why fast? Jesus did it. Jesus says, follow my example. And so we're going to open the Bible to Matthew 6, 16, where, where Jesus teaches his disciples about fasting. He says this, when you fast, do not look, look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces uh, to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, you have received, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that you will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. A couple of things that we notice about Jesus's words. Firstly, it's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say how, he doesn't say how often, he doesn't say when, and he doesn't say for how long. And I wonder if the reason that he doesn't say those things is because we can assume that they're secondary to what he does say. And what he does say is when you fast, not if you fast or if you feel like fasting. No, the expectation is when. The expectation is that if you're a disciple, if you're a follower of Jesus, then fasting will be a regular part of your prayer life. There's also an expectation for, from Jesus in the words that he speaks there that, that we're going to get it wrong. We're going to mess it up. We won't do it perfectly. Likely, we'll make it about ourselves. We'll want to make a show of it. We'll want other people to know that we're doing it because it will make us look holy and wonderful. Likely, when we fast, our motives will probably be a bit messed up and a bit mixed. In fact, the message version of those verses puts it like this. Don't make a production out of it. God doesn't require attention-seeking devices. So why then, why then fast at all? Well, again, Jesus gives us the answer to that question. He says, there's a reward. Who doesn't love a reward? I do. He says, he won't overlook what you're doing, speaking about God the Father. He will reward you well. But the reward is unseen. Again, the message translation says, if you go into training inwardly, act normally outwardly. Something is happening when we fast that we can't necessarily see for ourselves. And so Jesus is saying, the rewards of fasting, they're not visible. They are unseen. And so, so fasting is, it's, it's about not eating, but it's, it's about so much more than not eating. And, and if the rewards of fasting are unseen, that is, in, it's impossibly, it's impossible to, to fully dissect what exactly is happening when we fast. Fasting is not an equation. It's, it's not a magic formula. It's not a transaction. There is a spiritual, unquantifiable dynamic at play when we choose to fast, when we choose physical hunger to increase our spiritual hunger, when we, when we choose to make a physical choice, trusting that there will be a spiritual release that we may not even be able to see. Fasting is a physical action that we trust causes a spiritual reaction. And that's why it's good to be aware what fasting isn't. Fasting isn't a diet. It's not a diet. Fasting isn't a hunger strike like, God, I am going to stop eating until you do this thing. It's not abstinence either. Now, abstinence can be a really helpful discipleship tool. We may decide at any point in our lives to, to, uh, to abstain from TV or social media or alcohol or whatever it might be. And, and that could be really helpful, but it's not fasting. Fasting is not eating food in order that we feed on God's presence. John Piper puts it like this. It's the whole body hungering for God. Or Dallas Willard puts it like this. Fasting is feasting, not on food, but on our Lord and doing his will. And you know, Christians have practiced fasting since the church began. 
a typical fast for the early church, the Acts church, uh, was to fast maybe two to three meals in a row twice a week. That was kind of standard habit for them, a standard rhythm of fasting. Sometimes they would fast longer, sometimes people would fast individually, and sometimes as a whole community. And we read in the Bible that there were different reasons why fasting was an appropriate response. Sometimes it was a response to, uh, to sin. It was a, a form of repentance. Sometimes fasting was a response to grief, a way of outpouring grief through fasting to God. Sometimes fasting is to stand in solidarity with somebody who is oppressed or hurting, or, or, or sometimes fasting was a, as a form of prayer in the midst of serious crisis. You know, the early church saw fasting as just a key weekly rhythm of prayer. And as far as we know, the, the tradition of regular fasting carried on from the early church right up to John Wesley's time in the 18th century. In fact, John Wesley, he wouldn't ordain people as church ministers unless they were fasting twice a week. That's how serious he was about fasting. And then we get to the 19th, 20th century, and there is not a single book published about fasting from 1861 to 1954. And um, what we can assume is that it's because that there were two key things happening at that time that kind of collided together. Fasting at that time had become like a religious activity. It had become so religious, so regulated, so legalistic that it had been kind of stripped of all its spiritual power, spiritual benefits. At the same time, attitudes were beginning to change about the denial of anything that the body craved. This was the time of the sexual revolution and the thought of not giving the body what it wants when it wants it was becoming a totally alien concept. And let's, let's be honest, the reason most of us choose not to fast, for me it was the case, it's just it's too hard. It's too inconvenient, it's too uncomfortable because because the rewards that Jesus talks about for fasting, that they feel so unseen most of the time, so invisible. Uh, you know, the act of fasting in itself, most of the time, does not feel very rewarding. That's the reality. And yet, for me personally, the more, the more I've looked into it, the more I've practiced it, the more convinced and convicted I am that, that fasting is this divine tool that God is wanting to place in our hands. This divine tool that can bring change on the inside and that can bring change on the outside. God's desire is that you would know freedom. And the tension is that there's this tension going on within us. Galatians 5, Paul describes this tension between flesh and spirit, this internal tension that goes on within every human heart. Uh, and the flesh is the name that Paul uses to describe these disordered desires, these disordered cravings that we have, the, these cravings and desires that, that the human instinct wants instant gratification for. Like, I want it and I want it now. It's this tension between body and soul. Our body, our flesh, always wants to give in to those desires, to those cravings, whether it's sex or whether it's shopping or whether it's food. And it's, it's not bad stuff on its own. But when, when we just keep giving in and giving in to, to these cravings of the flesh, what happens is we, began, we begin to be robbed of our freedom. And the crazy thing is, we live in a culture that says freedom is exactly the reverse. Our culture says we will find freedom when we continually give in to our body's desires, whenever, whenever we like. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work if we keep constantly giving in to these desires, these cravings of the flesh. We don't find freedom by doing that. What we find is that we end up in prisons of our own addiction. We find ourselves battling with the consequence of those continual bad choices. The problem is the desires of the flesh at times feel like the strongest desires. And so it becomes really easy just to give in to them. 
But we also have these other desires going on, the desires of the spirit, as Paul calls it in Galatians 5. These are our deepest desires, the deepest longings of our soul and our heart. Uh, this, this desire to connect with God is probably the deep, deepest, a desire to have a relationship with him, a desire to follow Jesus, a desire to pursue the things of God's kingdom. But this side of heaven, we're always going to be a mixed bag of desires. And yet Paul tells us that we have to crucify the flesh, crucify the desires, the cravings of the flesh. And, and we do that two ways. We crucify the flesh through good old fashioned self-control. It's, it's not very glamorous, but self-control is the mechanism that stops us when we want to put ourselves in temptation's way. But self-control alone isn't going to do the job. We need God's help. We need to, to choose habits and rhythms that, that, that enable us to be in God's presence, to encounter God's word and God's spirit that will awaken those spiritual desires, like habits of prayer and, and worship and reading the Bible and, and being in community and fasting. Fasting is, is one of those habits that helps us to crucify the desires of the flesh and to awaken the desires of the spirit. Just, just to be clear, fasting is not about punishing the body. Also, there is something about not giving in to our body's craving for food that awakens, that makes us alert to some of the other fleshy desires that are going on inside of us. You know, no, fasting brings a whole new meaning to the term hangry, you know? If we are carrying anger in our hearts or, or, or maybe impatience or bitterness or jealousy or fear, those things, they will surface when we choose to fast. My husband and I, uh, we choose to fast most Tuesdays. That's been our rhythm. And so we eat dinner on a Monday night and then we fast through Tuesday and then we eat again uh, as a family on a Tuesday evening. Uh, and we have five kids. And so between like 4 p.m. when they're all coming back from school and dinner time, our house is crazy. It's, uh, you know, even on a normal day, that time of day requires a huge amount of energy and patience from me. Uh, and so for a while, I actually chose not to fast because I found that I would be getting like seriously hangry at around 5 p.m., just when my kids needed to be most calm, most patient, most attentive. And, and then I realized that actually fasting wasn't the problem. It was me. It was all the things that sat unprocessed within me. The other thing I realized when I first started fasting regularly is that I was expecting to have like these mountaintop experiences with Jesus by lunchtime. Actually, by lunchtime, I just felt really hungry, honestly. And the danger is we, we narrow down spiritual experiences to just the things that make us feel good. And again, we, we make it about us when actually fasting, fasting, we're supposed to feel discomfort. With fasting, we are supposed to feel the dissatisfaction that comes from physical hunger because physical hunger is the spiritual experience with fasting because it directs us towards a, a deeper hunger, a spiritual hunger for more of God, a, a hunger to do more of his will, a hunger to see God move, a, a hunger to see God's kingdom come. And so fasting is a divine tool that brings change on the inside, but it's also a divine tool that brings change on the outside. You see, what we know when we look at our Bibles is that when we fast, something shifts spiritually. Something is released spiritually. We might receive a, a breakthrough about a particular situation, or maybe we receive clarity, the clarity that we, we've been longing for around a particular circumstance. Richard Foster, the author says, fasting can bring breakthroughs in the spiritual realm that will never happen any other way. Again, 
It would be pointless to try and dissect what's happening spiritually. And so often, like any other form of prayer, it can feel like a mystery, that there's no formula. Wouldn't it be lovely if there was a formula to get the outcomes that we want every time we prayed, every time we fasted? Sometimes we fast and it feels like nothing externally changes. It can be very discouraging. We're in a battle. The Bible reminds us that the fight is unseen. The fight is against, not against flesh and blood. The fight is against the powers and the principalities that we can't always see. We cannot see in the unseen. But if we look through the scriptures, even as we, we look through human history, we can't deny that when God's people pray and fast, something happens. I don't know whether you've seen the movie Dunkirk. Uh, it's about that moment in the Second World War where it looked like defeat for uh, the Allied troops was inevitable. Um, but in the movie, it, it covers all the obvious details, but there's one key element of what happened that's missing. What the movie doesn't make reference to is the miracle of Dunkirk. And so if you know your history, you'll know that Winston Churchill was leading the country and it did not look good for Great Britain at that time. Britain had massively underestimated the force and the artillery of the German army. And at the end of May 1940, there were hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers, French, British, German, literally backed into a corner in France, completely vulnerable to the enemy. And it seemed impossible, seemed impossible. Military vessels had been sent to try and rescue the soldiers, but they'd, even, they'd either sunk in harbour or, or they were too big to get to the coastline. And the situation looked hopeless. In fact, Churchill, we know, was preparing for what would be the, the greatest military defeat. And then on Sunday, the 26th of May, King George VI, a man of real faith, he called the nation to a day of prayer. And many Christians committed to fast that day. Churches across the UK uh, were overflowing that Sunday. Apparently the scenes at Westminster Abbey were, were like nothing anyone had ever seen before. All because the nation recognized that something can shift in the unseen when God's people pray and fast. And so on May the 27th, uh, the scene was set for this massive German advance on the ground. Allied troops were totally exposed, only 10 miles away. But for reasons that historians can't really explain, the German commanders chose to halt their advance, choosing to wait to do an airstrike on the following day. And the only explanation for this is that they were so convinced that they had already won, that they already had the victory. And so the miracle took place on May the 28th. Whilst the German squadrons were still on the ground, Flanders, where the, the German squadrons were, was hit by this massive storm out of nowhere, making it impossible for this German airstrike to take place, giving the Allied troops the opportunity to get to Dunkirk on foot, to the coast on foot. And Churchill was aware at this time that, that even though the soldiers had made it to Dunkirk, there weren't nearly enough military vessels to fulfill this evacuation that was needed to get all the soldiers out. And so Churchill did this famous thing. He, he called all the civilians with any kind of boat, anyone who owned a boat in Britain at that time to make the voyage across the Eng English Channel to rescue these soldiers. And the nation responded. But you know what's interesting? Despite the massive storm over the German troops in Flanders, the English Channel at the exact time, same time was eerily calm. And because it was eerily calm, it enabled even the smallest boat to cross the channel easily and quickly and to get to the soldiers. They calculated that the best hope they had would be that maybe 30,000 soldiers could be rescued by these boats. But on May the 28th, with the enemy stalled by the storm and the weather abnormally calm over the English Channel, 300,000 men were rescued. It's hard to deny what happened in the unseen nearly 80 decades ago 
when the nation were called to pray and to fast. As I said at the beginning, my hope is that as you've watched this, you wouldn't feel condemned or judged if you're not fasting, but you would feel inspired to pick up this divine tool that God has given us, this tool that enables us to pray, that enables us to awaken those spirit desires within us, that enables us to, uh, to, to gain a deeper hunger for God. So I'd like to pray for you. God, thank you for this tool, this gift of fasting. And I pray for every single person watching that they would be inspired ultimately to come into greater and deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.